Welcome to the Strata Podcast. And I am so excited today to introduce you to Mona Ari. She is the founder and CEO of Momentum. She is an impact investor, a board member, a gender equality advocate, and a civil engineer for Bridges, where you were actually awarded a scholarship in Japan for engineering. Welcome, Mona. Thank you, Leanne. I'm so curious about your journey and your scholarship in Japan and what your time was like there. Yeah, it was it was really amazing. It was a huge inflection point in, in my journey and a life-changing experience. Uh, when I got awarded the scholarship um, in 1999, I was um, in the lookout for, you know, an experience abroad and, you know, um, to travel from Tunisia and explore the world. And so um, I got awarded the scholarship and I went to Japan. And so I did my master's degree uh, in engineering and I was counting on just staying two years. And that's what I told my family, uh, but I ended up staying there uh, seven years. Um, oh. I learned the language and also got my my job my first job in in Tokyo, and it was really exciting. I I was um, I loved my job and I I spoke the language fluently at the time, so um, it was easier for me to to integrate myself and and build my career. What was um, your native language? Yeah. Sorry. What was your your first language? Oh, my first language is Arabic, and uh, I was I studied my uh, engineering is in French in French. So at the time, Tunisia was bilingual because we were colonized by France. So um, and then I learned English, of course, as a third language in Tunisia, and then in Japan, of course, I had to learn the language um, and use it in my studies. So. And how was that? How would like you uh, said I could, because I've heard it's very hard. It's a it's a hard language to learn, but maybe not with your background in languages. So I had to really study hard. In in the beginning, we had six six months of intensive um, language uh, studies, and that was the condition actually to keep the scholarship. That's how important it was for um, Japan to uh, for foreign uh, students to learn the language. They knew the importance of integration. Um, so um, it was hard work, uh, but as I started learning and my proficiency le level uh, started getting higher, I gained confidence and um, I just loved it. So I was just a little bit lucky too. So. Nice. And so what was it like working there? Um, so as a woman, as you know, in Japan, it's, it's not easy. And engineering is particularly um, um, a challenging industry for women. It's male dominated. But because I spoke the language and I was a foreign woman, it was probably I got away a little bit with it and with some kind of special treatment of being, you know, accepted in, in meetings and, and not expected to serve coffee and, and things like that. But of course, my salary was much lower than my male counterparts. That's that's a reality. So, yeah. And was there a bit of an awakening when you were there about how sort of about gender equality and and how women were treated and expected to be uh, mm. because like had you had exposure to any of that before yes so it's it's really interesting that you ask that question because um Growing up in Tunisia, women in Tunisia are really emancipated we had um, very early on we had um um, our leader, Bourguiba, the first president of Tunisia, he knew that uh, by providing education to people and also empowering women, and um, of course, uh, dedicating a huge budget for healthcare, he knew that he will have a healthy society. Uh, he was a very smart man. And thanks to him, I grew up really in a society 
that is um you know modern and women have their 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 rights for education for even for divorce um so um i i didn't feel there are some sociocultural uh, constraints of course in tunisia but that's manageable uh, but most most girls go to school and you know when they graduate they they have high high managerial positions and um, and so growing up like that, I, I didn't really, I wasn't very conscious about my, my gender. But in Japan, interestingly, I, I noticed that, you know, for example, um, in the engineering department, there were less, far less girls in Japan than, le than in Tunisia. So, um, and then also their career path often goes to the public sector. They don't work in the private sector. And, um, and, and it's just, also, the the equal there's no equal um, pay, um, and the expectation that women would be serving coffee that was really something. It's not just in the books; it's actually real, um, and you see it happening in the company. So, um, yeah, that was a little bit uh, of a kind of, as you say, awakening. I really like how you put it. Um, yeah, yeah. I, well, it's it's funny because I also had the same experience but it was delegates from japan coming to the company i was with which was a, a fortune 100 company in canada um tel telecom and uh, the delegates came to us and they were i guess briefed before but i also had to learn how to greet them and it was then i was told about um the gender inequality in japan so I was, and they seemed honestly a bit uncomfortable by the fact that I was a VP and like someone on the executive team. So it was, it was interesting. It was very interesting. Um, so that was my first exposure to that kind of thing. So, um, and so from that point in your journey, like a lot of people were surprised at how much success you had in Japan, like the Japanese men, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then, so what was the point at which you decided to come back to Tunisia? Yeah. So um, after uh, about seven years, I had actually got a, a new position at the time uh, towards my last year in Japan, um, a new position to lead a French technology company. And uh, we were selling technologies to the Japanese uh, government agencies and um, infrastructure man management authorities and so because I spoke French and I knew the French standards engineering standards and the Japanese standards I was the perfect candidate for that and um, and so it was it was a really a new kind of new leadership role uh, for a western company but in Japan so it was amazing I and I and I spent two years in that role and my career started really taking off um, but unfortunately I received news from home and, and my father had a, a heart attack and um, and a stroke and uh, was very very close to him as I'm the eldest and I knew that my departure to Japan really affected him so um, I felt a sense of not guilt, but I really, really wanted to go back and 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 take care of him and and be there, and so that was the impetus for my decision um, to go back. And I abruptly interrupted um, that kind of um, job. It was a hard decision, but um, um, it was the right one because that was the love for my father, and and that. That has no equal. So, uh, so I went back to Tunisia. That was in two thousand and six, um, and spent time with him. And uh, very quickly, I realized, oh, I, I need, I need to work, right? I, I, I need to continue something. And then I saw an opportunity to, um, you know, to do consulting for Japanese engineering firms there in Tunisia, uh, who were building infrastructure um, projects with uh, Japanese taxpayer money. And so um, again, you know, understanding the culture, both cultures and speaking both languages, I was in a perfect position to provide a service and create value for both. And, and then I really started like thinking, oh my God, like I, I have a lot to give back to my country. 
And, uh, and so I, I set up my business very quickly, you know, set up the office and, and hired people. And I had a startup ca capital, but um, the business model was really like easy. It's a B2B and um, it was almost too easy. Everything went so smoothly. Um, of course, it's hard work, but I didn't um, encounter any, any failure in the process. Um, so that was the way the transition between Japan to Tunisia and at settling there. And in the meantime, I, I met my husband who was uh, working for the African Development Bank. He's German and, um, and uh, we got married. So, and then I, I got pregnant with my first uh, baby. Uh, and this was around 2010. And um, yeah, and then a year later, the Arab Spring Revolution happened. And that was, um, it was, um, it was a very difficult time. Yes, it was, yeah, it was and devastating. You had, exactly. you had just had your first baby. And what goes through your mind when that happens? Yeah, so I gave birth to my first baby just three days before the revolution. So, you know, that first week when you have a newborn, you're becoming a, a first time parent and it's exciting. And then uh, the war happens and you're like, okay, um, this is this is frightening. You you feel unsafe. Um, and there were many things happening. The militias were attacking homes. Um, you know, the military took over, the president fled the country. So there was no rule of order. Like it was, it was actually a really dangerous situation. So um, I immediately, I mean, over the weeks, we, we kind of uh, ran out of, we had situations where we ran out of food, there was no supply chain, um, there was curfew all the time. So um, yeah, over, I think about six weeks, we took the decision to um, leave the country. It was mainly my decision. I looked at my husband and I said, look, this is, we need to leave. And um, and so um, he quickly interviewed and he got um, a job offer in Singapore and then uh, really painfully left the country because, you know, I had my parents there. We had a really beautiful little cozy life. I had my business, um, which was going very well. And it was just hard. My father was recovering slowly from his uh, stroke. So things things were good, you know, and um, it, that was really an abrupt interruption to, um, to uh, in, into our lives. So that was in 2011 and we moved to Singapore. And then what did that, usually interruptions, when we reflect back, are usually the start of something, a new realization or something new. And so what was that like in Singapore with your husband leaving your family behind a new baby? And and what was that like for your identity even? It was it was very tough because up to that point, I have never encountered failure, to be honest. I I did not know what failure meant. Um and that move to Singapore at every level was challenging. It challenged me to my core. Um, I was a first time mom in a foreign country. I was um, grappling with, you know, who I was. So it's, it's interesting that you mentioned identity. So I had a sense of a loss of identity because I was this engineer, professional, entrepreneur, unstoppable, and never thought I could I could be held back or you know or or lose my footing anywhere. And uh, here I was attached to my baby, and I couldn't leave it behind to go and pursue a dream or or like my husband did. So it was a very, very, very difficult time where I also had postpartum dep depression. And I think many women can can relate to this. Um, yes, so um, hard times. 
challenging well, supported leaving your family behind not able to go out and find a job and really because you have a newborn and and your husband off on a new job and so what how did you deal with all that well you know over over time you when i lost my professional identity um i, I think I started uh, looking at, at other women or talking to other women. And um, and I realized very quickly that, it, that the reality in which I was, uh, you know, was confronted by other women as well. And um, this was really difficult um, to, to be a, to be a woman and still pursue your, your dreams it's just hard you have to work 10 times harder to to keep the same pace as 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 your as your spouse for example who who is like effortlessly almost you know pursuing his career yeah true, true. Um, although a great father but you know just the the career focus was was different and uh, so balancing motherhood with career aspirations was clearly a challenge. And um, being an entrepreneur, I, you know, um, I just um, started my organization, Momentum, <laughs> to support other women entrepreneurs. And in a way, turning those challenges into, into opportunities. I didn't think that way. Um, at the time, but it almost it almost felt like every hurdle I, I encountered turned into a stepping stone to support women. And I, I just had so much passion and for it. And, and also coming from a place of a pain, it, it was so hard that um, that really turned into like a driving force to, to to change the status quo because when you look around um you know we're a minority everywhere you know and and so and it's i think it's not you know it's not mainly because you become a mom um but it plays a huge role in slowing down women's careers and and access to opportunities especially uh, in the mid 30s when when you're supposed to really ramp up your career so yeah, and so what? So how did you come up with the name, and what was the first thing that you were like? What was the purpose of Momentum? I mean, to support women, but in what way? Yeah, so it's interesting that you ask about the name because it, it took it took me a whole day uh, enclosed in my room to be able to come up with that name, and it was for me um, important that the name. Um, relate to my journey and as an engineer and so I was like oh a name that's engineer in engineering in English okay come up and then I thought about momentum and so momentum and then you flip the m and it's a w and it's momentum and I was on google I was like maybe it's taking let me check if it's this domain momentum.com and of course there was one ngo in somewhere in Canada uh, that is called Momentum, but not many activities, old website. So I thought, okay, I added another O and I turned the double O into an infinity um, sign and it's a Momentum. And really just, uh, it's about giving momentum, uh, you know, women's dreams, momentum. And so, um, so that's the story of the name. Right. Because you are Momentum, really. I mean, you embody everything that momentum is. So after you started the company, what you you started to help other women in in a specific area, industry, how did that all start? Yeah, so it all started with this flagship event called Crowdfund Her Life. And uh, the idea was driven by the desire to bring women together as a community and that's because that's what helped me talking to other women and and really sharing our challenges and and hurdles um, in pursuing our career, balancing our family life, 
was very, very helpful because I felt, oh, I'm not alone. So the first thing was, how do we rally a community? How do we bring women together and shed the light on their successes and help them, you know, um, fulfill their dreams? And more importantly to me was to dream big because we don't see many women pitch their businesses, you know, to investors and, you know, raise millions of dollars. Of course, there are, we see them on the news, but they still make the news for a reason, because they're a minority. So crowdfunding is the concept was well known in North America, not so much in Asia. So I thought, okay, let me bring this, um, you know, more this concept um, and and um, create value to women in raising funds, but not only about raising funds, but rallying your community, rallying your potential customers, uh, validating your concept, your 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 product, the the service. And so, when people are willing to uh, pre-order your product or prepay for your service, that's a validation, and that's helpful when you go to angel investors or even to venture capital. Um, to raise to raise um, seed capital, you say, hey, you know, there is. I, ha I already have a hundred customers, or I already have five hundred customers, and so we did crowdfund her life offline. We had the first event; it was a uh, hundred women and a minority of men, <laughs> but mostly women. And then um, we we bring um, four female founded startups uh, to pitch their ideas. Of course, there's a lot of preparation done and uh, bring mentors and business advisors. So in the beginning, starting this, of course, I had to have so many coffees and lunches and almost beg people, you know, to support. But that was the inaugural event. And, you know, um, several years later, it became, a, you know, a really... Um, it went all over the region. So we went to Vietnam, to, to Cambodia, to, to Indonesia. And uh, we went also online. So we launched the first online crowdfunding platform in Asia for women. Um, it doesn't exist anymore now because, you know, unfortunately the concept doesn't really fly, but the offline um, format was very successful. We even used it with corporate. So we, we mobilized corporate employees to provide expert mentoring uh, and also um, consulting. So worth thousands and thousands of dollars, but sometimes we don't need funding. We really need that kind of um, you know, valuable insights and valuable business advice in order to, to start. So your first event was crowdfunded essentially yes so yeah and so who made the decisions on the people who like the first four businesses was there a panel of judges yeah so there was yeah yeah i didn't mention that so there's there's always a panel of judges and in these panel of judges either they are um leaders of large companies um you know like consumer companies so we match actually the profile of the panel of judges to the profile of, or and, and more precisely, the needs of the companies that we uh, bring on our platform. So we had angel investors, we had um, uh, business leaders, we had uh, VCs, and even in Vietnam we had a, a conversion, which is a great, you know, a key metric for success for momentum is when an investor invests in. The, in, in the, the woman entrepreneur. And that's where we celebrate. That's where we say, okay, you know, um, that's that's what we want to achieve to to bridge and facilitate that uh, that transaction for them. So what was your relationship with some of these companies after they received the funding? Did you stay involved with them? Did they go off and do their own thing? Like what what happens then? Yeah, so we had so many, like we, first of all, I didn't talk about the launch of what the Momentum app and the online portal, where we try to go O2O, -O, like offline to online. So whatever we do offline, we try to take the learnings, you know, I create, write articles and, and really connect people online so that we can grow and scale the, the, the online community and take them also away from Facebook because really Facebook is just social media. So you, we, need, we wanted to have a branded community platform where people can learn, can have focused conversations. 
um, and access resources as well. And we had online courses, um, et cetera. So most of the entrepreneurs come and, and you know, uh, sign up on, on the platform, stay connected. But honestly, <laughs> most of the entrepreneurs as well, they, they move on and, and you know, they, they grow their businesses and they're busy. Entrepreneurs are very busy. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and on our side, we didn't have, um, we also don't have enough resources to really stay involved with every single entrepreneur but we try we have a newsletter and we also have social media and we tag them there are you know celebrations here and there where we invite them for other events and we keep them in the loop um yeah so really it's uh, very have you ever um connected with other women that have women's organizations um that do not the same but very like similar in supporting and empowering women have you ever connected with them like I just have this vision of all of like you and some of the other you know empowering women uh to connect and then you have this web across the globe that is all of these you know women leaders that are helping women entrepreneurs globally instead of just you know but momentum is in like is it three continents and what was the number how many countries is it is it in yeah so we're based in in uh, in singapore and so the main focus is in south asia southeast asia uh, but of course the vision is to really expand further all the way to mena and and africa and in fact on our online portal we have uh, members from over 50 countries and we have plenty from North America interestingly we didn't do any marketing efforts but I think uh, people find us maybe through Google search or uh, you know Apple store um, so um, yeah so but the main focus really the main activities are in Southeast Asia we have plenty of partnerships we work with government agencies and I didn't mention that so we key strategic partnerships to um, reach um, the women business owners and you know every country we go we have a different strategy we go to Cambodia we have different needs we, we go to Vietnam we have different needs um, for example in Cambodia we have a plenty of efforts around financial literacy, digital literacy, training, but you go to Vietnam, you have more, you know, um, I would say you don't need much digital literacy there, but you need to bring VCs from Singapore or uh, you need uh, more training like from um, maybe um, hone the business model for them or so it's a different interventions that we have and in every single country we work with a local partner local partnership is very important because the world doesn't speak english and we always need a local partner that speaks the same language both culturally and literally in the same language to translate the content or also uh, introduce people to us and and um facilitate some communication with government agencies or with some sponsors. Um, yeah, so that's that's the way we, we operate in the region. How many women entrepreneurs, do you have a sense of how many you've reached, touched, inspired, empowered? It's 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 hard. It, it actually, I think of it as like an onion when you have several layers. And so the core, I would say about a thousand. We're over, so we're turning ten years in January. About a thousand where we really touch their lives um, more or less directly, um, either through um, access to learning or. Um, through fundraising or you know workshops so that's like but then the other layers are around uh, you know in social media and um, and on our, our online portal uh, where probably they're just maybe 
passive consumers of information. Um, I, I think the inspiration is there. We really, um, you know, there's one story that maybe it's a it's good platform for me to share here, where in Cambodia, we, we have um, partnered with a foundation and we uh, covered the story of uh, 21 um, leaders from private sector, public sector and civil society, all women, amazing, amazing, strong and successful women in Cambodia. And um, and so we published, so we told the story, we interviewed them, we told the story, and then we put it together in a publication in English. And I thought, mm -mm, that's not gonna work. We need this in Khmer, we need to translate this in Cambodian, because then we want the youth, younger women, and even men to read the stories of these amazing women. And these stories are very touching. I mean, these are business women who are successful because they sold their family house and they took such a huge risk despite all you know the, the, the cultural uh, constraints around that. Like you sell your house in Cambodia, I mean, it's huge. And it's very traditional for a woman to sell her house. That's not a good, perceived as a good mom or a good good family <laughs> member so um and these are the and then they they succeed and they tell the story of resilience and of never giving up so we translated that into Khmer and then we printed that into um into several copies in the hundreds and then we send them to rural area to uh, uh, distribute in the secondary schools and those are the things that really keep me going and you know, how many girls read the, 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 the publication that I don't know exactly. I know it's in the hundreds we distributed as, as, as much as we could. But if, if one girl can be inspired to continue her studies and go down to the city and go to university and build a business just because she read those 21 stories, that would be incredible. And I hope more, but if, if even one, I think to me, that's a huge success. So, For sure. And, and who knows how many more, like really, I mean, you're right. Even if it hit one or empowered one or triggered something in one, but really it's, I'm sure it's far more than that. Like yeah. you probably even through digital and then through the publication, you've probably reached young women and women far more than you even realize. Yeah, it's in the thousands for sure, yes. It's like social media. People scroll by, they see a video or a post or whatever. They don't react. And, but, you know, you often find out later the impact that you had through that constant communication through at the time, I guess, the blog. Um, it's kind of an amazing thing. So, but you also were working on the other side of things with research into yes. women in business and and sort of helping to get uh, research on women in business and and empowerment for um, for companies that would make a difference in in how uh, just in awareness, I guess. Yeah. So the research part happened with, you know, serendipitously. So it's like, um, we didn't really plan on having a research arm. Uh, we did that in a way that is intrinsic to our activities because we needed to understand the needs of women. We talked to women so there are, we have plenty of insights as we interact with women entrepreneurs, but this one was different. This one where we were, we had a, a partnership with a, another foundation. And um, this was the, one of the largest contracts for Momentum. And it, it, you know, it kept us busy for 24 months. And we did it across seven countries. So in the beginning, it was a few countries. And then I thought, okay, no, this is, we, we need to broaden the, the research and really understand if there are patterns that we can identify between countries. And we did identify. And, um, and so the idea was, let's investigate if digital technologies and digitalization in general and digital economy 
can help women overcome their challenges? Are there, what are the opportunities that are created for women entrepreneurs uh, using the technologies? And um, if they are not using it, why? And so we really kind of zoomed in and tried to understand what are the challenges and the opportunities? And when it comes to accessing financing, you know, taking a loan online or even opening an account or accessing mentoring or maybe um, improve their um, supplier, access a supplier network online, doing transactions online. All of that that we take for granted in the Western world, in the modern world, it's not necessarily true in, in developing countries, but even more so among women and so um, the foundation also was uh, aligned with our mission and with our belief that yes digital technology that, so that was the assumption digital technologies will certainly improve the lives of women and will certainly create opportunities of growth um, and and um, you know to empower them their communities their children and actually in the end um, as a society as a whole so um, yeah, thank you for asking about the, the the research. We have it on our on our website. We have plenty of publications that have been actually translated in um, in every local market we go. So we did South Korea, uh, so a little bit industrialized countries, less industrialized like Vietnam, but getting there. Um, then Cambodia, Indonesia, Myanmar, Malaysia, and Singapore, and we try to identify. Uh, the patterns, the commonalities of, of challenges for women entrepreneurs from developing countries and industrialized countries. And it always comes to the same thing. <laughs> Self-confidence and caregiving and the same thing that I went through, all women from developing countries to industrialized countries all go through and it's always a challenge for them. So it, it's very, very, very interesting. So the 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 space in your life when you when you have babies and have to look after them and sort of exit a career or exit the working world and then when they get old enough pick back up or it's just expected that they will look after the kids until they go off to school or something like what what is that is it I the think it's a package of of yeah of several several factors so we have caregiving what we have understood from all the interviews that um, we had and women are caregivers for their children but also for the parents and yeah. in some countries yeah. they're also caregivers for the family in law because of the societal expectations and so there are plenty of expectations and pressure on women. When you take a businesswoman and she has a small factory somewhere, you know, their male counterpart will go networking or take someone for a beer or let's say for tea in some other cultures. They will come back in the evening, take public transport if they don't have a car. There's no problem. The man can do it, can go out anywhere. But if you're a woman, you can't be networking and taking your clients or your suppliers or building relationship or just traveling, disappearing to Thailand and back, or you, you just can't do that. And, and because of the, the social ex societal expectations. And so that really, of course, hinders, you know, the opportunities for, for, for growth and, and missing out on many opportunities. So... I think understanding those those challenges for women and also thinking, how can we make it easier for them? You know, do you need to go to the bank branch? You can just do it on an online digital banking or... What is next? What is next for Mona and for Momentum? And because you had a pause. Uh, well, we all had, we had a global pause during the pandemic, but you had an extra pause um in between and and what what do you think is next uh after 
10 years of working with women entrepreneurs and for women entrepreneurs. And I take a lot of pride of doing this. Um, I think the next step, uh, I'm, I'm looking into the next decade of of my my decade and momentum decade seem to be overlapping a lot so i give up it's going to be momentum again <laughs> there's no escape not that i want to but um um what i observed is that access to financing still remains a massive challenge for women, especially in the region. And this is due to so many factors. The research covers it, um, be it the mindset, be it the knowledge and the financial literacy, or also regulation around ownership, which uh, creates challenges for collaterals with banks. So there are women who are, many women who are not banked, and many women entrepreneurs who have small businesses who cannot take loans to grow their businesses that will push them in the corner of informal businesses. And that really just perpetuates the problem. So I'm seeing that one way to get women to build sustainable businesses and to uplift them and enable them to uplift their families and children have a better future is to help them access financing. It's unacceptable that millions of women in Asia are don't have a bank account. And when I say women, personal and business, if they have a business uh, account. So there are, um, in other terms, Momentum wants to focus on financial inclusion. And there are plenty of uh, projects out there that being um, done in, in, in Africa and um, you know also in Asia, plenty of initiatives, but it's simply not enough. We almost need every other organization to advocate and, and do something about financial inclusion. So that's where it starts. And I think um, you know annually, you know the United Nations actually estimated about 89 billion dollars. Annually, we would be, um, if women, if all the women who are not able to build their businesses, who are not starting their businesses, if they fulfill their potential, we would be able to um, um, have an additional $89 billion um, as an income for the whole region in Asia. So that's huge. Uh, that's a huge untapped potential. But most importantly to me, I think when women are financially empowered, they also end abuse and they are stronger. They can protect themselves. They can uh, protect their children. And so that's the direction that we want to go. Um, and it's it's work in progress. Uh, we're looking at a centralized platform to partner with many digital banks and commercial banks uh, to provide access to financing and financial literacy to uh, women entrepreneurs of low income. Nice. And I think it's also confidence has a lot to do with that as well, right? To ending abuse and empowering women. And <clears throat> when they're confident, and then they become uh, financially empowered, then that helps a lot of things. Yeah. So you you like to say, and it struck me, um, that women are good investments. Yes. And just tell me briefly what you mean by that. Um, but first of all, you know, the large consulting firms have made endless and very expensive research just to prove that if you invest in women, you get higher returns. But I often shy away from that argument because then it makes men go like right, <laughs> rise eyebrows. So it's not about competition. But there's a reason why that research showed 
was the research results were consistent over and over again. You know, if you want anything to get done, give it to a woman <laughs> because we're busy. <laughs> we will just um, get it done. So in terms of like efficiency, uh, you know, yeah, completion of projects or even repayment of loans, over 98% of repayment in, in microfinance uh, or even in commercial banks, women never default, almost never default. Um, and then um, uh, the other thing that is really, really important, I think to the world, especially in our time, is that really women do care about, naturally about the planet, nature, peace, and, you know, we just can't see children being, you know, uh, abused or, or human trafficking. We're very, very sensitive by nature to these things. And, um, and so we have lots of empathy um, in the way we lead and in the way we work. And research also proves that if you connect to your employees or to your customers, if you have that ability to empathize and, and, and integrate that into your leadership style, you achieve better results. So at every level, women are a very, very good investment. I love that. It's one of my most favorite things. So uh, I just want to sort of, uh, we're at the end of our time, but I, I wanted to ask you and, and on maybe a little bit of a softer note, which was something that almost made me tear up your religion. <laughs> well, my religion is love. That's my official religion. And also the official religion of my children. When they ask mama, what is our religion? We say, it's love. So, I love the universe. I love people. And if we use a little bit more the language of love around us and in the world, I do believe that we will have a very, very, very happy planet and very happy people. I agree. I agree. And that's why I love that statement so much. And mm -hmm. I think if we all approach each other from a place of love, we would be a much better place yeah and the good thing about religion being um love is that your temple is everywhere you can carry it with you everywhere and it's here so yeah and it's renewable and we have as much of it as we want every single day yes abundance an abundance Abundant love. yes that's right that's right it's the one thing that never gets limited and we never run out yeah, I, I I hope that especially today in these, you know, circumstances around the world that we use and tap into more love around us. We could all use that really good advice. And it's so true. It's so true. Mona, thank you very much for this interview today. I loved speaking with you. Um, and I hope that we can have you back um, when there's some new things happening. Thank you, Leanne. We'll definitely come back. So we'll share more updates about Momentum and about all the stories that we have. Yes, please. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leanne.